Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, I hope everyone's doing good. So if you don't know me, my name is Michael Abraham. Public school teacher for a long time. I work as an educational consultant and teacher trainer. Uh, both in the public schools and charter schools and in Islamic private schools. If you're at Juma yesterday, I believe there's a fundraiser for Asufa Academy and I'm working with them very closely this year. And I wrote a book called Engaging Muslim Students in Public Schools. And I have a training program that goes along with that that over a thousand educators here in the Twin Cities have taken. So I've done several sessions here already, some more geared towards the youth, some more geared towards the parents, although really either session is, uh, no matter the direction of the session, it's geared towards both. So today is a good opportunity to talk about two topics. One is parent-teacher conferences, because most schools in the state of Minnesota do their first round of parent-teacher conferences in the third week of October, which is next week, because next week is what, to, what is called MEA Weekend. MEA Weekend, if you don't know, it stands for Minnesota Educators Association. There are two big teacher unions in America, the NEA, the National Ed Educators Association, and their Minnesota branch is called the MEA, the Minnesota Educators Association, and the other big teachers union is called the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, and their local branches are actually multiple by district. I was a member of the MFT, the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers, Chapter 59, or I'm sorry, Minnesota Federation of Teachers, Chapter 59, which is from Minneapolis Public Schools. So the, Minis the, the union, the Minnesota Educators Association, they hold a big professional development conference, usually in St. Paul at Roy Hawkins Auditorium on Thursday and Friday of next week. So that is, and that got to be so big that the state eventually made it so statewide, those two days are off days for schools for teachers to do professional development, primarily through the union, not everyone goes. Sometimes teachers just take it off. And usually schools will sync that up with parent-teacher conferences, and they'll do them maybe Tuesday evening next week. A lot of schools might have Wednesday off next week, and then they have conferences all day during then. So parent-teacher conferences are a big deal. And they're a really good opportunity. I've talked a lot about advocating in the public schools, uh, making recommendations to the schools, getting to know the personnel in the schools better, using it as an opportunity for them to know our community better, and advocating for the kids. A lot of times parents are confused or nervous about like, well, how do you make initial contact with the school? You certainly have a right to email your kid's teacher at any time. You have a right to email your kid's principal at any time, you can do that. Sometimes people are nervous about that. Well, parent-teacher conferences are a time where they ask you as the parent to come in and come talk. So it's a time where you can talk about things. And when you go to parent-teacher conferences, it's not going to just be your kids' teachers who are there. The principal will be there as well. So you can make a point when you go into the building on parent-teacher conferences to ask where the principal is, or if you can have a minute to talk to the principal, because it's a really good opportunity to talk to the principal. I'll talk a little bit about, in the parent-teacher conference, some things pertaining to you and your kid, and for the kids, pertaining to you and your parents, that you can talk about and collaborate a little bit on, and talk to the teacher about. And then I'll get into some kind of broader things that you can bring up to the teacher and the school principal and ask about. And then, time permitting, I will get into school board elections because it is election season. I'm getting lots of questions about elections in general. There are, every year there is important school board elections going on. School board elections are something that there is a lot of detail to understand about. And school board elections can be very different just from one district to the next, even if they're right next to each other. And it really is a big opportunity for the Muslim community to not just be involved in the Twin Cities community, but to influence it in a positive way. If we know how to um, strategize about it, or play the game, if you will, the right way. Would someone do me a favor, brother? Would you just check, make sure that the camera's picking me up the right way and 
reposition it if I need to, make sure I'm in the frame the right way. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I'll talk specifically about Osseo, because Osseo is having elections next month. I'll talk about why Zeta, who is not having elections next month, they have elections in the odd years, but that actually makes it more of an opportunity, as well as Anoka Hennepin, which is near here. Okay? So with parent-teacher conferences, okay, between you and your kid, first of all, have a talk with your kid about the conference before you go into it. And assure your kid that you're not going to be mad at anything for them, what comes up in the conference, or that they tell you about it. Assure them that any problem that comes up, it's something you're going to work together about. Also make your kid understand that the parent-teacher conference can be a chance for them as a kid to influence what is going on in the classroom and in the school in a more positive way. Now you tend to have a part of the parent-teacher conference where your academics are talked about, and then you kind of have the behavior social stuff that's talked about. A lot of times kids know what's going on socially amongst kids in a way or a little better than the teachers know. Not that the teachers don't know what's going on, but some kids kind of understand some detail about it. Teachers don't always know exactly what a kid's internal experience is in their social experience at school. So if you assume that your kid is a well-behaved kid, you know, ask them if there's anything where they've made a mistake or something like that, first of all, because you don't want to be surprised by anything that you're going to be told when you go in there. But you can also ask your kid, are there some specific kids who are always a bother in the school? Are there some specific kids who are bullying other kids in the school? Are there specific kids who swear all the time in the school? And the more specific questions you can get to and ask, the better. And I will just tell you, especially in fifth grade and above, even in fourth grade, and maybe not even totally absent in the grades younger than that, kids swearing constantly in school is a big problem, and it is something that is going on constantly. And I have the impression from a lot of educators that they've almost like given up on it. Like, oh, it's just what kids do. I mean, American, it's part of American adolescent culture. It always has been. But it is something that the kids are constantly being exposed to. And it is part of uh, American adolescent vernacular, meaning like the common language that they use and some of the terms that they use to refer to common and everyday things are um, substituted by swears in American adolescent culture. And it's not appropriate. And it's extremely annoying. It's extremely disturbing when our kids do it. It's very disgraceful when our kids do it. And Muslim kids do it plenty in school. They do it a lot. And it is disgraceful. And so, sometimes the kids do it because the general social culture and atmosphere makes them feel like they have to because they're going to stick out or, you know, they won't be like everybody else if they don't do it. And there's a few kids who are less mature and seeking out more attention when they're at school who are the really big instigators with that type of thing. So for the kids, understand it's okay those kids who are bullies or problem makers or bad examples for other people in the school it's o and in your class, it's okay to name those kids to your parents. And for the parent, it's okay to name those kids to the teacher. Doesn't have to be in a mean way, doesn't have to be in a way where I'm saying you have to do something, but it can be like, hey, my kid has mentioned the name of this kid as saying a lot of swear words and it bothers my kid and it makes my kid feel uncomfortable and I don't approve of my kids swearing I don't like the idea of them being around swearing and I would like it if that happens in the school at all that kids are redirected about it okay this point in swearing there's a lot of things we could talk about but it's something that's very very uh, visible if you will or you know you hear it it's something very very present in the public schools going on all the time certainly in middle and high school but also in upper elementary school that you know when you have the parent teacher conference this is official communication that you are having with the school so the school has to be re responsive to concerns that you bring up and if a, if a school comes together in a staff meeting and three, four, five, six teachers have all had a parent bring up to them that they're concerned about the kid 
being uh, exposed to swearing going on in the school, that can put some pressure on the school to have a more wholesome and be diligent about implementing a more wholesome culture and that type of thing in the school. You might specifically ask, with behavior issues, you might specifically ask if your kid swears in school. You might think your kid is a kid who would never do that. And if you do think that about your kid, for the most part, they probably are. But they might find themselves in social situations and getting so used to hearing this kind of language around school that they feel social pressure to have to use that type of language when they're in school. So they end up using it sometimes. So it's an okay question to ask specifically to the teacher whether or not they do that. You might also ask just generally the teacher, does your kid seem to be more concerned with academics or do they seem to be more concerned with what's going on socially in school? Because most kids you can put in one or the other group and most kids are more concerned with what's going on socially. And let the teacher know that you prefer that they be more focused on academics, okay? With, um, a lot of times in elementary school, they have kind of a specific format that they go through um, in parent-teacher conferences where they will first go over data concerning the student, which specifically means the results of their standardized testing. And they might go over their spring scores from last year from the MCAs, which is the test that every kid has to take in the state. But also in September, the schools do what they call benchmark testing which is not a test that they have to do by the state, but pretty much every school does it, where they will give them a test that is like the MCAs, but it's from a different company, and they use it as a benchmark to see where they are in reading and math. So they'll go over those scores, and then they might say something about their experience with them, their behavior, this type of thing. You know, if your kid is below grade level in reading or math, it's not a bad idea to get them a tutor, and it will have more impact on them when they're younger than when they're older, because you don't want your kid to get behind in general. But you know, also too, sometimes when you go into the parent-teacher conference and the, you know, teachers vary on how prepared they are, but in general, they'll go over academics and then they'll say something about behavior. You don't have to feel like, you, you know, you can let them say your piece, but it doesn't mean that everything that you, that you can't bring up your own things. You know, once they get through all that, they should ask you, do you have any questions? Quite all right to have some questions prepared, such as, have you ever seen my kids swear, swear or something like that? You know, if a question you have is based on a talk that you and your child had beforehand, then that's a good thing, because the teacher's really going to have to be responsive to that. If you have an experience with a teacher where they're complaining about your kid's misbehavior, and they really want you to do something about it, you know, don't get defensive about that, like stay calm. Sometimes people take that type of thing personally. Some teach, teachers differ. Some teachers really use that as a way to get the kids to behave, like, oh, I'm going to tell your parent. There are some teachers who they prefer not to go that route. The teachers who prefer not to go that route, honestly, they're the better teachers because they have more confidence and more skill in themselves to be able to deal with the kid's behavior in school. And teachers should be able to deal with kid's behavior in school. So if a parent brings that up, you know, you don't have to get like emotional or worked up about it either way. You don't have to backlash at the teacher and saying that, you know, they're doing something wrong or it's their job or whatever. A lot of teachers get that. But at the same time, you know, you can wait to hear your kid's side of it and all that type of stuff. You don't have to like, you know, you can just tell them, well, I'll talk to them about it and that type of thing. Because if you get that sense that the teacher is really kind of relying on you to get the kid to behave, that's not necessarily a good thing, okay? Is there any questions about like talking to the teacher about the kids specifically before I get into some kind of higher level stuff regarding engagement and like sort of advocacy in the schools and how you can use this as an opportunity? And if you think of a question, you can always ask it later too. There'll be plenty of time. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Another thing you can ask the teachers about, and I would recommend making a point to see the principal and ask about. Ask about reviewing the kids' curriculum. So elementary school, you can ask the homeroom teacher, is there a way I can review the kids' curriculum? I want to see what they're going to learn for at least the end of the semester. Okay, the school will usually do quarters, 
and then two quarters is a semester, which ends like in January, usually. Some schools do trimesters. But ask to see the curriculum. And if they want you to be more specific, focus on language arts or English class. Some schools might call it communication arts because that is the area where more things of a more social and values-based nature is brought up and that is where the stuff that the Muslim community is concerned about and other communities are concerned about right now, that is where that stuff comes up. So say, I'd like to know what the, I'd like to know what the curriculum is going to be for language arts. Specifically, I want to know the units that are going to be done. I want to know the topics that are going to be done. And I want to know the books that are going to be read. You can ask for that. You specifically have a right by Minnesota state law to review your child's curriculum. The Minnesota State Statute 120B is the broad statute that covers education law in Minnesota. Minnesota Statute 120B.20 is entitled Parental Curriculum Review, and it gives every parent explicitly in the state of Minnesota the right to review their child's learning curriculum in its entirety and it also says, quote, if the parent, guardian, or adult student objects to the content, to make re the school has to make reasonable arrangements with school personnel for alternative instruction. So it's explicit in Minnesota state law that as a parent, you have a right to know what your kid is going to learn ahead of time. And if it's something that you object to, you have a right for the school to make accommodations so they learn something instead that you don't object to. And that can include just opting out of whatever they're going to learn. Usually prior to high school, if there's something you object to, the school won't mind just having your kid opt out. If you want your kid to opt out of some sort of learning that everyone else is going to do, it's best to work with the school so the kid is not in school that day. Why? Because sometimes our kids experience that the parent doesn't want him learning this or that, and then it comes time to learn this or that, and it's, okay, Abdi, time for you to go down to the media center, and then the kid sticks out in a certain way, and kids tend to feel uncomfortable with that. And then the kids might start feeling like they got to push back against you wanting this because it's making them feel uncomfortable. If the school itself has or feels some sort of issue with you asking the, to opt the kid out, they might not be, you know, they might, I don't want to say do that intentionally, but they might be less sensitive about the manner in which they remove the kid from class or have them do something else because they feel some kind of way about it. So it really works best to work with the school so that on the day when your kid's going to be learning whatever you don't want them to learn, that they're just not in school for that day. Or when that class period comes up, you pick them up from the school and they just miss it. Because the kids won't mind missing school. And they're already in school too much, honestly. They don't need to be in school as many hours as they are. That's a whole separate topic. But the kid won't mind that. And, it, it will, and, and you also make it so the school doesn't have to do all this different arranging. Okay, now parents in, uh, I believe it was Osseo Senior High last year, did this in like a large scale way where they were learning about something the parents didn't want, they asserted this right, and the school put those kids in a different learning thing uh, when that came up. I don't think the school was happy about it, but you know, it is what it is. You have that right. Now, the state statute in Minnesota, it specifically says also each school district shall have a procedure for a parent, guardian, or an adult student to review the content of instructional materials to be provided to a minor child. So this law actually makes it so the schools are already supposed to have in place a process by which you can review the learning curriculum. Now I point this out because in my experience in education, which is very, very thorough here in Minnesota, most schools and most educators, they don't know this. You don't get taught about this when you're doing a teaching license. And I know both from being in schools and working in them in the school districts and also asking for this with different parents that a lot of schools, they don't actually have this in place. Now, I'm not saying to talk to the principal in like a legalistic manner where you're pressing, don't get angry with them. 
But it is a good idea during the parent-teacher conferences to say, I'd like a minute to talk to the principal, to that secretary, or whoever greets you at the door. Find out, sometimes the principal's at the door, and say, I would like to know what your process is for parents to, to review the learning curriculum of the kids, okay? And use that specific language, because that's the language that's in the law. You'd like to know the process that they have in place for you as a parent to review the kids' learning curriculum. Now, like, and the reason I say use that language, like, okay, because the parent-teacher conference is something official that the school's done. You're there in an official manner. It doesn't have to be said in such language, or you don't have to, like, say, you know, this is Minnesota state law, I have a right to do this. You don't have to get like that, but you are making a request that you have a legal right to. So if they are unable to provide it after this, they are violating rights that state law gives you. And, you know, again, like we don't want things to get, have to get litigious. This did happen in St. Louis Park where we had to get lawyers involved and stuff and the parents eventually got this. But in that case, the school was unprepared. They asked the school principal for this and the school principal was like, whoa, well, what? Like, well, you know, what are you talking about? We can't do that. I, in a large district, actually in the south suburbs, with the leader of another masjid and a group of parents, we sat and talked to the superintendent of the district and the, um, the principal of the high school there. And even the superintendent, he really didn't know about this law. And they were very cooperative with us. It wasn't like a bad situation. But he said to us, well, the parents can just ask the teachers what the kids are learning. That's not really having a process in place for the parents to review. And even though this law has been on the books in the state of Minnesota for a while, like schools really aren't used to parents like exercising it. So it's something new for them. So you do want to be a little bit patient with that. In general, any right that a parent has in education, when the school carries out that right for the parent, they have to make it accessible for the parent. So if you don't speak English or you don't speak it perfectly, they should give you a curriculum review process where they have a translator that can help you understand. So it's not like appropriate for them to just say, oh, look at this link or look at this website or that type of thing, okay? How much detail they have to get into in this, that's not really hashed out in law. And like you would need like a court case to determine that. So it's not necessarily like you can see every day lesson necessarily that the teachers are gonna do, but at least topics that are gonna be done week by week and books that kids are gonna be read, read and exposed to and what the learning objectives of the classes and the units are I mean, that at minimum, it should not be hard or impossible for the school to get to. And because it gives us parents this right to opt out of what they object to, it makes sense for the school to be open to hearing about what types of things you object to so you can kind of get to the point with some things. Okay? Is that clear to everybody? You get what I'm saying? Okay? Yes. Uh, So the question for those, if anyone's watching the video later, is why would there be pushback from the schools to not really provide the curriculum? It's not that schools don't want to provide the curriculum, but I mean, there's different aspects to that. Number one, if they don't have the process in place to make like reviewing the curriculum easier for you, like now they've got to do a whole bunch of work. You get what I'm saying? And educators in general are very, very busy. Um, in school districts, in the districts, not the charter schools, but the districts, the teachers all belong to unions. The union contracts dictate what, it essentially limits what administrators can ask of teachers in a way. Do you get what I'm saying? So like, even though teachers ostensibly are making lessons for every class or that type of thing, like, it's not always the principal is not always incentivized in terms of managing his staff to like be making them provide those every day or that type of thing. So sometimes the materials aren't prepared for all intents and purposes. You get what I'm saying? So there's all, you know, with any school, there's this public face that they like to put out to make it look like they got everything together and everything's all nice and perfect. But behind the scenes, it's a whole lot of, plenty of chaos. You get what I'm saying? 
So it's more of that type of anxiety. Now, the extent to which the school districts are in tune to the fact that like our community and parents have these specific concerns about specific types of curriculum material, you know, that has maybe changed over the past few years because certainly Osseo has dealt with parents talking at the school board. So parents there might know about it. St. Louis Park had an experience with it. In Maplewood, we had a thing. There's been different places where, and these things have been in the news to some degree. So like some school administrators might know what is being got at here, but that doesn't change what your rights are. Okay, you get what I'm saying? Okay. Now this relates to another thing you should ask about, and you can ask the teachers about this, but another thing you want to ask the principal about. By state law, every school board has to have an advisory committee formed. And by state law, there has to be parents on that advisory committee. And it is supposed to be by state law parents who represent the diversity of the community. So our community ought to be represented there. Now, how you get on a school board's advisory committee, I can tell you, you can Google search, you can look on school websites, you will have a very hard time finding anything that just tells you that explicitly. Probably people who have some sort of close connection or maybe a longer standing relationship with the school district in general are the types of people and parents who are getting on those types of things. Doesn't mean that we can't ask and find out what the process is and try to wedge our way in there, and we should. That's for the school board. But you can ask the school principal, do you know about the process of getting on the school board's advisory committee? Or do you know um, about, does the school board have an advisory committee? They do have to have one by state law. So he should say yes, and then, or she. And then from there, you know, do, do you know about the process of how to get on it, okay? This is a very good thing to ask about. Similar to that, state law does not mandate, but it highly encourages sco the schools themselves to have a site team or a site council. And it also stipulates that when the schools have a site team or a site council, that meets with the school administration regularly, that advises them on policy matters, that advises them on curriculum matters, all this type of thing, it specifically says that that, that has to include parents. And I believe it says that when the school has a site council, it has to at least be equal parts parents and teachers, if like teachers are on it or that type of thing. So you should ask about the school's site council or site team. They might call it a site committee. And how do you get on it? And you're interested in being on it. And see if the school has one. Most of the schools in these big districts should have one. With this, I do want to delineate. Okay, so this is the state law. The site team must include an equal number of teachers and administrators and at least one parent is what it says. And then this is the law for uh, the District Advisory Committee, which says whenever possible, parents and other community res residents must compromise at least two-thirds of advisory committee members. Okay, so that's the thing. Parents and community members, there's supposed to be two-thirds of these school board advisory committees. Notice, too, if any of you don't have kids but you live in the district or you live in the district but you homeschool your kids or you send your kids to a private school or something like that, it says community members. So you don't actually even have to have kids going to a school in the district to be on the school board's advisory committee. And I will tell you, some of how this stuff has gone on in schools that we don't like, it's like, well, how do they start having these books and this type of stuff? I guarantee you a big part of that was diverse parents advocating in these types of forums because other communities have been active about being on these things. So we need to get our place in there as well. And it's something that we at least need to ask about and find out about. Sometimes they might refer you to the PTA, to the Parent Teacher Association, because most schools in Minnesota will have a Parent Teacher Association. Now understand that the Parent Teacher Association is not a part of the school, and it's not a part of the school district. PTAs are nonprofit organization. Well, there's a national parent-teacher association, 
and the local PTAs per school are branches, branches, they are 501c branches formed under that nonprofit. They're not a part of the school. Now, sometimes because the PTA of the school, the Parent Teacher Association, or PTO, they might call it Parent Teacher Organization, sometimes because they've been involved with the school for so long, it might be that on the school board's advisory team, or the school's site council, like the president of the PTA or the parents who are really involved in the PTA are their parent people on there. So then the principal just equates in their mind that parent involvement with my committee is done through the PTA. But, it, but the school cannot mandate that you have to be a part of some nonprofit organization in order to be on their advisory committee. Do you, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Some schools, they even have the PTA's, uh, like a link to the PTA's email and their bylaws on their own website. Sometimes they'll put it up there. But if you look at the PTA's email, it won't be the same dom domain as the school's because it's a separate organization. Okay? It's a separate organization. So just understand that. Because that could be a way, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get you to anticipate. Because even though, because... I'm just trying to get you to anticipate some ways in which the principal of your kid's school, they themselves can be confused or not totally clear on some things, because it happens a lot. Also, too, the law that um, dictates the advisory committee and the site council, that is law 120B.11. The parental curriculum review one was 120B.20. Now, I... It's important to understand the differences of these two because one of the purposes of an advisory committee for the school board and a site council for the school is curriculum review, which means reviewing the curriculum through a process through the year in order to improve the school. So both of these laws, they both use the language curriculum review. But 120B.20 that means curriculum review in terms of parents' rights. Every parent, this law, 120B.20, gives the right to every parent to review the kid's curriculum. 120B.11 is part of setting up a process for the schools for school improvement, where not every parent is going to be on that advisory committee or school site team, but the ones who are, they review the curriculum in terms of quality assurance. And if you're a parent on those committees, you can have more influence than other people on what ends up in the kids' curriculum. So it's a good idea to be on it. But I say that too because I've ran into it with schools, and this is what I got from the superintendent in the district of the South Suburbs I was talking about earlier, where you bring up curriculum review to them, and what triggers in their mind is, oh, the advisory council, or oh, this is the site team. It's a separate thing. A committee they have put together for, for reviewing the curriculum every year for the sake of refining it and improving it and altering it and all that type of stuff, that is not the same thing that Statute 120B.20 gives you. It's separate. And it's 120B.11 that the school principals and administrators are more familiar with and that they know better and work with more. Whereas the parents' rights stuff, the culture of education, is they kind of try to ignore that stuff because people don't like to deal with it. Do you get what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? Okay? So ask about curriculum review. You can ask both the teachers and the principal. Ask about the school board advisory committee. Ask about the school site team. And just say you're interested in being on it or you're, no, you're interested in knowing the procedure to be on it. That's all. They should be encouraged by the fact that you want to be involved. Now, the other thing, just know, uh, Minnesota state law, the education codes, it has a heavy emphasis, and it uses the language specifically that school curriculum is supposed to be culturally sustaining, meaning it's supposed to help the kids sustain their home culture. Minnesota law, when it comes to curriculum, it uses the terms age-appropriate and reflecting the diversity of the community quite a bit. There is all kinds of justification in state law that the curriculum should accord with what we want our kids to learn or at least shouldn't really go against it. 
But what ends up happening is whoever tries to influence these things more through these channels is who ends up having influence, and that hasn't been us. Now, the other thing that you can do, because teachers, teachers have to get their licenses renewed every five years, and in doing their, in getting their license renewed, over those five years, they have to do 125 hours of continuing education in the field or professional development, 125 hours. And those hours have to be certain amounts done in certain categories. The first category that the Department of Education dictates that teachers get continuing education in is cultural competency training, which includes the following elements. And a few years ago, they added to this specifically religious diversity. And I believe it's actually the presence of our community, and I hope to think my own personal influence on the education community here, that helped influence that. So teachers actually have it as a professional mandate to, that to get relicensed, they have to do at least eight hours of cultural competency training. And one of the subcategories, which is specifically delineated to do it in, is religious diversity. So please recommend to your kid's teacher that they go to abrahameducation.com where they can access my course, Engaging Muslim Students in Public Schools, which is an eight-hour course. They can have their entire CEU requirements for that category met just by doing my course, which I have self-paced and everything, or I can come to their school. But it's also a book, so you can also recommend the book to your kid's teacher. You could even get it on Amazon and give it to them as a gift. And if you bring your kid to the parent-teacher conference and your kid sees you say to your teacher that, you know, as a Muslim family, our religion is very important to us, it's hard for us as Muslims to have other people outside our community know what it means for us to be Muslims, you, are, of course, are very important to us as my child's teacher, so I'd like for you to have this book because this will explain to you what it means for my child to be Muslim and what it means for him to be Muslim in public school and some of the challenges that he faces, but also how you can help reinforce the values that we teach at home. Because that's what my book does. It teaches teachers, here's how you teach the kids, here's how you talk to the kids, that complements what Muslim parents do at home as opposed to clashing against it. And there's all kinds of justification in educational research that the more you draw on a kid's home culture and community and family experience, the better he or she learns. And I go over all that in the book and all this type of thing. So just a suggestion, of course, I benefit from that personally if you do that. But I encourage you to do it. It's the whole reason I put it together. And I mean, how can they say no to you? I don't know how they can say no to you. Especially if you bring it up in a parent-teacher conference. And if a school has the experience that five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten teachers all had parents recommend this to them, you know, they might eventually say, hey, maybe our whole school should do this training. And of course, you can bring it up to the principal as well. Say, I'd like your staff to do this training. The time that the teachers have away from students in August and in the days throughout the year to do professional developments, the principal always has some influence in that. There is always a certain amount of hours that are allotted to the principal to use for his staff for professional developments, and he or she get, can decide what they do during that time. It's actually the main way that I end up in schools training entire staffs. It's because the principal in the school invited me there and asked me to come. And sometimes that comes from a teacher saying to the principal they should do it because they did my training before or a parent pushing for it that way. So, and this is just a way more broadly that we can educate um, the Twin Cities community as well as the country more broadly about Islam and about what it means to be Muslim because the non-Muslims need to know because otherwise we're always hiding being Muslim in a corner somewhere. And when we do that, the kids start to experience being Muslim in a certain way where it's like, yeah, it's something really important when we're in the masjid and when we're at home, but when we're around other people, we don't really talk about it and we kind of just keep it to ourselves. And that affects them in a certain way. And it's hard to assert that, but this is a formal way that you can assert that. And it's a way that the people can learn about the religion in a way that is formal. It's not reactionary to something. It's either get, they get taken through a learning continuum from A to Z, which is what we need from people, okay? So please do that. And encourage other parents that you know to do that 
as well. Okay, questions before we go on to school board elections, uh, parent-teacher conferences. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> if a question comes to mind, you, well, there will be time later too. You can always ask it later. Okay, <clears throat> school board elections. All right. So you know, a great thing. America has a lot of like local uh, stuff. Okay, America like was built. You know, we had the revolution in 1970 or 1775 and all that type of stuff. The American Constitution was formed, but America was really built where it was built like locally first and not built so like top down. And much of its governmental institutional structure still exists that way. And it's a really big opportunity, especially the school systems. It is actually against the Constitution for the federal government to mandate a curriculum on the entire country. It is a violation of the Tenth Amendment of the United States Constitution to do that. So schools have always been local first. The state government can do that. But even the state governments, they don't usually say you gotta use these books, that type of thing. They just outline broad standards that the kids are supposed to accomplish by each grade. Most decisions that go on in school happen locally, and that's why these districts all have a school board, which is the executive, it's what runs the school district essentially. <laughs> Excuse me, as elected officials, and it's, it's what really makes them public schools, that they are essentially run under the auspices of elected officials that we call school board members who hire the superintendent and uh, pass policies, all that type of stuff. Now, from one district to the next, school board elections can look very different. And you, you know, part of how we just need to start getting more involved and being on these advisory committees and stuff so we know what's going on in the school district is just to begin knowing more about how the school board elections work. So some things you have to know about each district. Do they have their school board elections in even years or odd years? 90% of them have them in even years, but the 10 or 8.5% who have them in odd are some important districts and some districts near us. This is important too, and I'll show you specific numbers with this because, okay, we're in an even year 2024, and the next year is an odd year 2025. When are more people going to vote, in the even year or the odd year? When are more people going to vote? In the even year, because there's the presidential election, there's the senator election, there's the gubernatorial elections in the even years. So districts where the school board members are elected in the odd years, the voter, the voter turnout is like anywhere from 50 to 90% less. So it's actually a huge opportunity. And like strategizing around getting different people elected is different depending on when the election is, okay? Does the district do at-large electing of the members or do they do sub-district electing of the members? Meaning, does everyone in the district who lives in the district boundaries, do they vote for a certain amount of people and you're voted on by everybody? Or is the district itself broken up into sub-districts by neighborhood and each sub-district has a member who represents it? Or is it a mix of both? It's not uncommon that, that's what Minneapolis Public Schools is, they have sub-districts and then there's like one or two spots that are at large. So sometimes it's a mix. Because the amount of votes you need to get an at-large seat versus a sub-district seat, it's different. And then you get into the boundaries of these things and you have to strategize upon that. And our community tends to be concentrated in certain areas. And there's no reason we shouldn't have control over who the school board member is of areas where Muslims are concentrated. It should be people who come from our community and not just someone who's, you know, it should be people who we've like decided would be good for it, okay? How many seats the school board has varies from district to district and the length of the term can vary from district to district and you need to know all this stuff about your local school district to really understand the school board. Now, in Osseo, anyone a parent in Osseo here? Any Osseo parents? How can we not have any Osseo parents? The Osseo parents arranged this. Any YZ parents in here? Any YZ parents? 
Any Anoka Hennepin parents? Any? Okay, we have some YZ. How many school board members are there in YZ? How many school board members are there? How many school board seats are there? How many, uh, or do they do the, their elections in even or odd years? Good, they do it in odd. The first, the first guess was not right. There's eight school board members, not four. They do it in odd years. But each odd year, they have four seats up. So they have four-year terms in YZ, and their vote, and half the members will be up for election every odd year. So the people who were elected last year in 2023, they'll be up for re-election in 2027. And the people who are up for election in 2025, they'll have re-election in 2029. And it's four seats each year. That's how it works there. Osseo has six school board seats. They are all at large. And they're all four-year terms, and it's done in even years, and they have an election coming up. Okay? Now let's look at Osseo a little closer for the benefit of the Osseo parents. If you're watching this later in the video, you won't see the screen. Too bad you missed it, but I'll try to make it so you can see it. So we're looking at the election results in Osseo from 2022 from the Secretary of State. There's a process in Osseo to get on the school board ballot. I don't think there's a limit on how many people can be on that because it changes from election to election. And every even year, they're electing half the school board. So there's three seats up every year. The, when a person votes, they fill out three people. They can vote for three people. Whoever are the three people that get the most votes, they get the school board seat. That's how it works in Osseo. So in 2022, you had Thomas Brooks get the most. So he got on. You had Tanya Simons have the second most, so she got on, and you had Sarah Mitchell get the third most, so she got on. Now, Kelsey Dawson Walton had the fourth most, so she did not get on. So if we look at Kelsey and the third place person, and look at the difference between the two, Sarah Mitchell had 21,873 votes. Kelsey Dawson Walton had 19,754. So the difference between the two of them is 2,119. Now, if we go to the Brooklyn Park Masjid, or let's just take this masjid as an example. How many people do you suppose are in a masjid about this size, or one of our main masjid, for Juma? How many people come in and out on a Friday? Okay, like this place has two Jumas. So I would assume they don't have enough room in just this space for just one Juma. They have two. How many people come in and out of our, this masjid or one of our main masjids in these school districts on Juma? How many would you say? What do you think? Ballpark. It's got to be more than 100. It's at minimum 500, I would say. I would say it's probably about 1,000. In a masjid this size, the Brooklyn Park Islamic Center, it could be 1,000 to 1,500. You know, so... 2,000 votes makes the difference. It doesn't make a difference. It can make the difference for the Muslims. So if the Muslims like get aligned in how they're voting, even in a district like Osseo that is very big and votes in the even years, so more people are turning out because they probably had 50,000 people or so voting here. You, we, our community can still make the difference. Now, if we look at 2020... Look at their 2020 results. They had 11 people running. So it's not limited how many people can be on the ballot. You had three people who got the most. And then this fourth person who didn't. The third most person, Jackie Mosteda Jones, had 18,299. And Melody Brinkley, who missed out, had 15,250 for a difference of 3,049. Now... What has happened in Osseo with the parents going to the school board and they asked me to come here and do these talks because they're all concerned about the issues there, that'll happen because after the 2020 election, the next June, the school board passed a policy pertaining to how the school district interpreted gender identity that everyone didn't like. Now, this is the thing. The third place person here... Jackie Mosquita Jones, who's up for re-election next month, 
She voted for that. It passed four to two. One vote was the difference. She voted for that. But Melody Brinkley was a more conservative candidate, had a private school background and a public school background, was explicit in her campaign about sticking up for parents. She more than likely would have voted against that. So 3,000 vote difference, and that policy wouldn't have passed in Osseo. Now here we are four years later, I think we can assume that there's probably a thou at least 1,000 to 1,500 non-Muslim parents in the district who maybe voted one way in 2020 that also are not happy about that policy passing, who are planning to vote a different way this time, and then if the Muslims can make up another 1,000 to 2,000 of those votes, you can change some school board seats here. It's entirely possible if our community were together on this and we were focused on it. It's entirely possible. And in the long term more, like we should be fielding our own people. Now, in a, if we were to have someone run in a district like Osseo, they'd have to have a like broad appeal if someone does like a thorough analysis of the maps, because maps are very important when it comes to elections, we can probably identify school board seats throughout the Twin Cities where we could elect someone maybe with just votes from our community. For example, YZ is an odd year place. So they have four people elected every odd year. Now, where it, now YZ has the biggest high school, YZ is a big district, just like Osseo is. So here you have people winning with you know, 20,000 some odd votes, 18,000, 19,000. In YZ, these are the four people who won in 2023. The most had just under 6,000. The lowest had 3,645. Probably in YZ, the Muslims could produce half that many votes. Not to mention we have kids turning 18 every year who add to that pool. If we get them in tune to this the right way. So I don't see why in 2025 uh, we can't have someone chosen. There was a Muslim who ran in 2023, I think, um, for a YZ school board, but I don't think she, got elect she didn't get elected. I Maybe mean, it was 2021. I think Miriam Siddiqui, Miriam Siddiqui was her name, I think. But I, I don't see why this community specifically, if you got together, like just think about the amount of people you have in Juma, you'd probably have at least half the votes someone would need to get elected to the school board. No reason it can't be done. And YZ is at large. It's not sub-district. So you could, have, you could even um, elect multiple people. So I think this community here should make this a goal to take over the YZ school board over the next five to ten years. It's not unreasonable. Something to think about. And, you know, the nice thing, too, about school boards, I mean, people kind of know the ways in which people lean politically, but it's actually rare that someone gives a party affiliation for school board seats. People usually register as non-affiliated for a school board seat. So it's not like we have to have someone run who has to like tie themselves to a political party because people get all kinds of sensitivities and uh, different interests when that happens. You know, They can just represent our community very str strongly and by extension serve the broader community. Okay, now, does anyone know what the biggest school district in Minnesota is? Does anyone know? The largest school district in terms of people. Hmm? Yes, Anoka Hennepin, absolutely. Anoka Hennepin is the largest school district in Minnesota. Anoka Hennepin, most students, most money too, of any school district, and they have school board elections in odd years. And they do their elections by sub district. Anoka Hennepin, as a school district, is further broken up into six sub districts. And there is one person elected for each one of those districts. In 2023, district, and it's like um, the other districts where half the seats are up every election cycle. So half the seats were up in 2023, another half will be up in 2025. These ones were up in 2023, they'll be up again in 2027. 
District 1, 2, and 5 in Anoka Hennepin. Look at these numbers that these people won with in the biggest school district in, Amer in Minnesota. 2,490, 2,189. In this one, this guy won with 1,775 votes. He won a school board seat in the biggest school district in Minnesota. Just a 300 vote difference. You know, you look at this seat, District 2, that's 113 votes made the difference. You're telling me that doesn't exist in the Muslim community? It exists. If, if you look at the district map, okay, we zoom in on where District 2 here is. Okay, you see 65 there? What street is that? What's, does anyone know the name of Minnesota State Highway 65? Central Avenue. You ever been on Central Avenue? Yes, we've all been on Central Avenue because there's Muslims up and down Central Avenue. Right where that red target is, this is from Google Maps, that is um, Blaine, yeah, that's the Blaine Islamic Center. It's a big Islamic center. And you got, you know, Jefferson Elementary, these schools right around it. That seat was won with one, th with, no, with 2,202 votes. That seat on Central Avenue. You get what I'm saying? There should be someone with a Muslim name holding that seat. It'll be up again in 2027. You know, 2,000 votes is not a lot. That has to exist in Blaine. Muslims are in Blaine. And only part of Blaine is in Anoka, Hennepin, Spring Lake Parks, and Centennial are also in it. But those aren't very large districts. You know, so we need someone to, uh, you know, I mean, I can do more of this, but I can only do so much. But, um, you know, we need to do this type of analysis in our community. Because, and school boards are one thing. The state house is a whole other thing. Because the state house districts get very small as well. And I'm sure that if we looked at it in a concentrated way, we'd get people. The Republican Party here, or the think tank behind the Republican Party, they are really pushing for the state to pass um, what they call education savings accounts. That would be a program where, excuse me, it's very similar to vouchers, to school vouchers, where the state money that goes for funding of a student in school, instead of going directly to the school, it go to the parents. And then the parents could use it for private schooling, private schools, but also, actually, the system, the education and savings account system, also allows them to use it for homeschooling and tutoring. So, the Center for the American Experiment, which is the main think, it's based in Golden Valley, it's the main think tank of the Minnesota Republican Party, they and some other organizations have done surveying, and they have found that that program has support in the state at 70% amongst Democrats amongst Democrats. So they actually think it's something that could be passed even without the Republicans taking over the state house and the state senate. And in the state house, you need 68 votes to pass something. The Republicans have 64 seats. So they would only need four Democratic votes. And I think there are three Muslim Democratic members. Maybe they could be swayed to be those votes. In the Senate, you need 34 votes to pass something. This, the Republicans have 33. Assuming all the Republicans in the Congress would, would support education savings accounts, you only need to give them four more votes in the House and one more vote in the Senate, and we could get like a voucher-type program, something even better than a voucher program, passed in Minnesota. And we have about one Islamic school seat in Minnesota for every 50 Muslim kids, roughly, if not more, that are in the state of Minnesota. It's like disproportionate compared to other communities. We really only have about three Islamic schools, and only one of them is like a full K through 12 school. So, and that's why there was a small school uh, doing a fundraiser here. And that school has 170 students, so they're doing very well. I'm, I'm training their teachers this year. They're doing very well. But they are like in this small office building, cramming 170 kids in there and doing the best they can. Inshallah, they're going to get a bigger building, you know, and people are supporting. 
But I mean, we need, you know, relative to some other communities, our community is fairly low socioeconomic status as a Muslim community. So we need help with private school funding. And if we got our stuff together, like the, these, the margins that is going on in this state with many different things portraying the school board and the state government is like not large. And we have a tight knit community. We have people who we are congregating every week in Juma. We're more communal than other communities here. As much as we might think we have this, this and that problem with ourselves. So, you know, I encourage uh, any parents who are involved in the schools to only continue to be involved. If you're leading something like that, you might be a good person to run for a school board seat. We need to start suggesting that to people in our community, that they run for these types of things. And it should be people chosen from the community. Like the Masajid don't have to get involved with endorsing candidates and this type of stuff but they can do like some encouragement of someone to run and to actually be from the community. Because something that does happen, some of the people we do have who are elected to offices, there may be uh, Muslims, but they were, weren't like really like involved in the community if you understand what I'm saying. Ilhan Omar is kind of an example of that. The reason she got in that seat was because she was involved with the Democratic Party. Not because she was really involved with a masjid or Muslim organizations or anything like that. So the Muslim organizations and centers that do exist, they should take some uh, initiative with this and encourage people to run and strategize around this because these things are there to be had. I'm just telling you, I'm going to benefit from it. So I say all this, I ask Allah for forgiveness. Anything good that I said comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything wrong that I said comes from the deficiencies within myself. I bear witness that there's none worthy of worship but him alone. And I turn to him in repentance. I'd be more than happy to take questions from anyone. And um, sisters, if the sisters have some questions, you can feel free to, um, to ask them. If you want to come closer, it's no problem. You can come up and, and ask if you don't want to project your voice loud or anything. Um, I just had a quick one. Yes. Well, look, anyone can run for the board. There's a, there's, there's a procedures you have to go through to get on the ballot. You understand? Okay. You know, there's always a write-in. Like you see on here, it says write-in. You know, like anyone can be written in and it's a vote for you. But to get on the ballot, you have to file by a certain time. Usually, really, the only requirement is that you are a resident of the district. That's usually the only requirement for school board. And I mean, that's with elected office in general in America, you know. Now, if you have some educational credentials, that can help ostensibly. But it happens plenty of times that someone who has no experience in education or anything like that, they get elected to a school board. That happens plenty. But it's usually a matter of filing by a certain time period. And a, lot, a lot of times it's in August. It might be in May. It depends on the district. It changes from district to district. But you file by a certain time, you pay a fee. That's usually, that's usually what it is. You might, they might, some might have a process where you got to get a certain amount of signatures collected. But if no one knows you in that community, how do you get votes? Well, I mean, you're going to be on the ballot, so you start campaigning. You know, you, you put signs out, you know. But look, I mean, someone from our community, if you're involved in a masjid or something, you have a head start. The, the way I see it, anyone in the Muslim community, in any of these places, has a head start. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a revert. So I know the non-Muslims very well. Every Muslim I know is connected to more people than, than non-Muslims. You get what I'm saying? You know, we might not always have as much money. That is something that helps people, you know. But, um, but you know, we have people. And in a democratic society, you know, why not leverage the people that we have to um, benefit ourselves as well as others? Yes. Yeah, good question. So the question is, um, what's the role of the school board members and how are they going to help our community? I mean, look, the school board is the governing body of the school district, J just as the Congress is the governing, is the legislative body of the state. So anything that is a district-wide policy gets passed through the school board. 
Um, anything, you know, pertaining to district initiatives will have to go through the school board, okay? So they will do all kinds of things. Um, you know, a big thing they do is they hire the superintendent. That's a big thing. Or they choose to let go of the superintendent. You know, that's a big thing. You know, the structure of the school district, the departments it has, a school board can change that if they get the members to vote on it, you know? But, oh yeah, budgeting is a huge part. Budgeting is a huge part, of course, you know. Um, in most school districts, they have policies, and the school board can change the policy, but like, you know, I'm in the world of professional development and education, so I get hired by school districts and schools to like go talk there. A lot of times, um, you know, it will be delineated, like each school principal has this amount of funds that they can use for professional development, but if they want to go over that, it's got to go through the school board. And then the same thing will be set for each department, okay? You know, one thing you can do with policies in a school board is you can set objectives and initiatives for the departments, okay? Like, you, you, you know, you've probably heard school districts all talking about equity for years now. Equity, racial equity, this type of stuff. A lot of times that stuff really gets going in a school district through the board passing a policy of making it an overall priority, you know? So school boards have all kinds of power, you know. Like you got to get the votes. So in Osseo, you need four vote votes. Why is that? You need five. All that type of stuff. But but you know, it's a governing body. You know. Why? Any other questions? It doesn't just have to be about the school boards either, because we talked about conferences as well too. Or anything. You guys aren't there yet, as we said. Sure. Okay. I see. I see. Yeah. So what the what the state statute stipulates is the schools have to have a process in place for parents to be able to review it. It doesn't say they got to go put it in front of the parents. Do you understand? So they don't have to, like, let you know. But if you ask, they got to provide. That's what it is, you know, basically. So you, so you do have to ask. We do have to ask. Yeah, yeah, I was, I don't know if you're in the room, but I was saying the parents. Because the principal will be there when you go to the school for parent-teacher conferences. You know, and, and you can ask the individual teachers. But you should say to whoever greets you at the door, which might be the principal, but the secretary, whoever, they got sent out front, I'd like to, is, you know, where's the principal? I'd like to speak to the principal for a minute. And then ask, I, I want to know what your process is for parents to review the curriculum. I want to review my child's uh, learning curriculum for everything that's coming in the year. And they're supposed to have a process in place. They're supposed to have a process in place. There are some school districts who, um, they do presentations in August where they go over. There are, there are some who do that. And those, but, but it's not most from what I've seen where they have had something proactive like that. What I've more seen is they kind of fumble with that request a little bit, like they're not ready for it. And, you know, again, like, you want to be patient with them. You know, um, I could help you guys approach the district. I did that in... Uh, the district won't say the name in the south suburbs with another masjid and some parents. Because one thing about it is, like, what I told that school district was they need to put something together specifically for the Muslim community or the East African community. Because, like, we have specific concerns. And, you know, that's a thing, too. Like, it could be done where the school people could come here. You could do that. They could come here 
and present to the community. And that would increase transparency on their part and all that type of stuff, maybe. You know? All that type of thing. Yeah. Now, the, one, the only thing the law says, it says that, um, well, when it talks about requesting alternative instruction to something you object to, it just says the accommodations have to be reasonable. Okay, reasonable. So what exactly that means is not, like, delineated in the law. And it's something that you could, like, you know, if, if, if a parent tries to abuse that right, that's where the school could say, like, this isn't being reasonable. And maybe it would evolve into a court challenge if the parent disagreed. And what reasonable means then gets hashed out in court law. But there isn't very much of that in United States case law or Minnesota state law. You get what I'm saying? So, you know, you want to be reasonable because they have the right for it all to be reasonable is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Any other questions? Ask about the swearing, both to your kids and the teachers, like I was saying before, at the conferences. I'm serious, it's a big thing. And I want people to say something about it so that the schools feel some pressure to do something about it. And then ask about curriculum review and ask about being on committees. A school site committee, we'll call it a site council, a site team, or a site committee and then the school board advisory committee. Start finding out about that, because these are the channels by which um, that are su supplied for by state law that we gotta get into, and everything falls from there. And when it comes to also, too, like one day fielding more people to be on a school board, like if you have experience in those types of places, that will help quite a bit, you know? You don't have to be an educator necessarily, Part of why we struggle with this is we don't have enough people in education in our community. We're, we're outsized in other, um, in other areas. So, Jazakum Allah Khairan, Wa Barakallah Fiqh, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh.